Give us an awareness today of the cross. We'll never know, Jesus, the price you paid. But Holy Spirit, we ask right now that you will make Jesus so real to us today, Jesus. Come on, church, agree with that. Just make Jesus so real to us. Holy Spirit, it's you that makes Jesus alive to us, Jesus. It's you, Holy Spirit, that makes him real. So Jesus, I ask right now that you will just walk into the room, Jesus. Touch your people. Holy Spirit, we welcome you right now. We welcome you, beautiful Holy Spirit, into this place, into our lives, Jesus. Oh, forgive us, Lord, if we become professional Christians, Jesus. Forgive us, Lord, if we think that we have figured you out. We will never figure you out, Jesus. There's always more, Jesus. So today, we cry out for the more, Jesus, Lord. Come on, just cry out for the more, Lord. We cry out for the more today in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, take us deeper, Jesus. Take us deeper today beyond what we can even understand, beyond our expectations, Lord. I thank you, God, that we'll go into depths that we've never known, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, as a church, Lord, we thank you, God, for a deeper understanding, a deeper awareness, Lord. We welcome you, Jesus, today. We say, have your way. Have your way in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Seal it, Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's give it up for our amazing band today and worship team. They did so beautiful. I'm going to invite my husband up. I never get to do that. Come up here, Michael. Welcome, Michael. Hey. Good morning. It was beautiful. Well, you're all happy today. Let's keep it that way. It's going to be an awesome day. Michael and Larissa Miller from Upper Room are going to be ministering to you. And, uh, so excited. <laughs> I told you uh, about five weeks ago to put your seatbelts on. That we were in a really holy season. And uh, let's grab it, right? Certain moments uh, come to you sovereignly, and then some opportunities come sovereignly, and you have to grab them. So this morning, may we all just be completely pierced through in the depths of our hearts. And uh, I'll introduce them in a moment. 
I don't know what you guys have planned, but just make yourself at home. Whatever you want. Um, you ready to give to the Lord? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I don't get to do this as much as I'd like to anymore. I actually do really enjoy teaching on giving. I'm going to take about three or four minutes here and just share a few scriptures with you. May the day come where I don't have to do this anymore. Amen? We're almost there. and We're getting there. But I'm so proud of you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we were able to send a couple hundred thousand dollars to the church in Afghanistan uh, in one day because of your generosity. And um, it's making a huge difference. And you can stay up to speed on that just by following YWAM on social media or Andy, our dear friend Andy Bird. You can just continue to follow uh, what they're doing. But a few moments have I been more proud as a pastor. And by the way, it's partially Miller's fault that I am pastoring. <laughs> we, uh, when we started the Jesus Nights, I think after the first one, he goes, hey, pastor. I said, bro, I'm not a pastor. They're just weekly meetings. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, here, and here we are. Yeah, here we are. And what a joy it's been. All right, write this down. I just want to share a few keys with you so that you can live this way. This isn't to get a big offering. This is so that you can live in obedience and in the goodness of the Lord for the gospel's sake. Write this down. Giving is the way of our God. And our God lives in us Therefore, giving should be our lifestyle. We don't just give, but giving is a lifestyle. Hey, Raul. Oh, sweet, man. You're too far away. All right. Giving is our lifestyle. In Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, I know you guys have heard this. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits, say firsts, of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats overflow with new wine. The Lord is after first, listen carefully, the Lord is after our first because the Lord is in love with us. That's really important that you see it that way. In any marriage, it's vital that you put your spouse first. And so the amount is not the only thing the Lord is looking at, but the order in which we give expresses love. That's why the Lord is after our mornings. It's best to give the Lord your best. So the Lord doesn't just see what we give, but the priority and when we give what we give. So for it to qualify as tithe, it must be first. And that is an act of love and romance. Amen? Let me share one more passage with you. Romans eleven sixteen says, For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Now, obviously, this is speaking of Israel and <clears throat> them receiving the gospel first. But this is still a biblical principle in that if the first is holy, and let me just say this, it can't be holy until it's in his hand. Does that make sense? So in order for it to be sanctified and blessed as Jesus broke the loaves, it must first go into his hand. And the moment it touches his hand in the right order, it is then blessed and the entire lump is holy. That's where you got the Pentecostal cliche that it's better to have 90% blessed than 100% cursed. It's actually true. So what we first need to do is bring it to the Lord in proper order. So the disciples needed a miracle. And notice Jesus said, before I distribute and multiply, first bring me what you have. Once it touches his hand, it is blessed. But it must be given to him. So this morning, maybe you've never done it this way. I don't want you to give to Jesus' image. And I don't want you to give towards the church or toward a great cause. There's nothing horrible about that, but there's a higher plateau. And the higher plateau is to actually give to Jesus. So something Jesse and I started doing, gosh, 
when we first started dating, which was 2003. My Lord, where the, where the years have gone. We started saying this when we gave, Jesus, we're giving this to you. And every uh, bucket, every time we sent a text to give, we would see the hands of Jesus outstretched in front of us and by faith place it into his hands. And the Lord has been good to us. Amen. All right, so let's prepare our hearts this morning. Let's give. If you'd like to give by check or, or uh, cash this morning and you need an envelope, if you still do not trust technology, I feel you. I totally feel you. And you need an envelope, just raise your hand. Our ushers will get to you. Okay, we've got one there. We've got one in the back. Got a few, yeah. So, so uh, Court, can you get back up there? Court's playing keys this morning. She's like Bo Jackson. You can go this way. Why are you going that way? Yeah, come on. No, 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 come on. Court's playing keys. She's such a trooper. She's like, I got it. <laughs> Our, uh, both keyboardists are resting. They poured their hearts out. We, we actually preached a youth conference this week at Church in the Sun, and it was great. And Miller preached. The upper room team's there. So they, uh, they're taking a little break. So Court's stepping in. We love court here and your glasses and the best outfits in the world. All right, let's pray. Come on. Father, we love you. You've been so good to us, so kind, so generous. So Lord, in Jesus' name, we bring, we bring these offerings directly to you. Directly to you, Jesus, as you sat by the offering bucket in the temple court. We believe you're watching now and that this moves your heart. So we bring you something that moves our heart, that yours would be moved as well. Bless your people in these last days. Prosper them, protect them, increase them. Protect every pastor who's visiting, his churches, his church, his family. Protect every business, protect every missionary. I pray you do exceedingly and abundantly above all we could ever ask or think. Bless your people and further the knowledge of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before, uh, before we uh, go any further, I just want to throw up, let's throw up some of the latest images of the building. I just want to keep it before you. That's the Bethany House of Prayer, as you guys know, and that is actually literally a peninsula on the lake in the back of the property. That stained glass there is Mary of Bethany pouring her oil on the Lord. Uh, I think, let's show another one. That's the Bethany house from the outside. So there's the, the prayer and worship house there. And all of them are maple trees like, like Pine Valley and Pinehurst. Yeah. No palm trees allowed. We don't want you to feel like you're in Florida. We're over the heat. So we're trying our best here. Go to the next one. <laughs> That's the uh, main sanctuary and... Uh, as you guys know, that's the back stained glass that's behind the platform. Let's see if we have one more of the interior. I think we, yeah. So that's the inside. Don't worry. We will not have neon lights and smoke flying through there unless it's the cloud of his presence. But um, there you go. So let's just stretch our hands in faith. Father, we thank you that in the name of Jesus, you'll bring in every dollar needed and that the nations will come to be with you, adore you, and love you and that you would be deeply adored there in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're watching online, we want to thank you for watching. Thank you for joining us every week. And if the ministries bless you, we want to invite you to give by text to give as well. If you're giving by text to give today in the house, you can just text give to that number on your screen. God bless you. We'll be right back. Hey, buddy. In the press. You make it new wine in the soil. Every voice, every voice.
Miller. For those of you who don't know, they pastor Upper Room in Dallas, and they have other campuses, and they are such dear friends to us, and it's such an honor to have them here today. I don't think there's another house in America where we feel such a kindred assignment, uh, especially in this season, uh, to minister to the Lord more than we feel with Upper Room. And I've had the joy of walking with Upper Room now since I think 2012. I preached the gospel with a bunch of Upper Roomers in the backyard of a business guy in Dallas while they were eating burritos. And amazingly, the power of God fell. <laughs> and I fell in love with that community and started just hanging out in the back of the church when I would come through Dallas. A friend of mine named George Brandon said, you got to come check out these wild people who meet near a, I think a vet clinic or something like that. And um, they're the real deal. And Jesse and I do our best to give you people who really love the Lord and whose lives exemplify that at the pulpit and away from it. We try to expose you to people. In fact, we we do expose you to people who love their families, who take their marriages very seriously, who love their children, and who deeply love Jesus. And so when we felt the Lord stirring us, especially regarding this season, that God had something special for us uh, as a family, Michael and Lo were at the top of the list. And so I love you guys so much, and thank you for being here. They've got service going right now. Uh, in Dallas, <laughs> but they're here with us. So I want you to receive them right now as family. Let's honor them and welcome them. Thank you guys for being here. We love you so much. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. much to say because I know Michael has a word I want him to share, but I just had to get up and tell you guys, in case you don't already know what a special thing that you have here. And I wanted to thank Michael and Jess for just your zeal to keep things pure and true. And to all of you to tell you thank you for how much you love Jesus. I was just Worshiping, thinking Jesus doesn't need to be dressed up because he's so beautiful. He just needs places where he can be honored. And um, I just don't know of another couple, another house that I so, like, I can't wait to get in here and worship with you because I know I'm going to see him. I'm going to be changed by his presence. And so I just wanted to say thank you. And then if you, if you happen to be visiting, I just want you to know this is one of the best houses in the world, the house of God. And these leaders are just unlike any other. So I just wanted to bless you and thank you today. Okay, I'm going to pray for you. So, Lord, oh, we love you so much, and we want to hear from you. And we believe, Jesus, what you said. We believe that your words are spirit and life, that they're not just words, but they do something to us. And so we ask you, Holy Ghost, through Michael today, teach us. Teach us, teach us. We want to see Jesus. We want to know him. We want to be changed today. We want you to come and be in our midst more than anything else. So fill Michael with your presence even more, Lord, we ask. Amen. Well, good morning. Really honored um, to be with you and to see you. Uh, I talked to Michael weekly a lot of times about you and so to be in the presence of people that I've been praying for caring in my heart 
Uh, seeing Michael's love for you has grown my love for you. Uh, you have uh, an amazing father and mother here. Um, and so it is, it's truly, truly an honor. God's doing a new thing. Um, there's a new thing that he's doing, and it's through a company of people like this. Um, and I'll put a little more language to that here in just a second. I want to honor the birthday boy, though. Did y'all know it was Michael's birthday this week? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> it is your birthday, bro. Happy birthday. Dude. Yeah, you do have a lot of grays to be 29, but you're nailing it. And I was praying for you on your birthday this week, and I, I felt the Lord lead me to a scripture that I really, I, I feel like it frames who um, Michael Kulianos is and who I've seen him to be. It's out of Psalms 78, and it's a description of David. And it says this, it says, that he chose David, his servant. This is Psalm 78, 70. He chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from the care of the ewes or the, the, the young suckling lambs, he brought him to shepherd his people and Israel, his inheritance. And this is the verse that got me. It says, so David shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with his skillful hands. Wow. And I wanted to uh, just speak that over you, Michael. You are a true shepherd, and God has chosen you from the sheepfolds or the fairways and the greens. <laughs> he took your seven iron and he gave you a shepherd's rod. <laughs> but I think he found something in your heart. You know, David's journey from the sheepfolds to the place of authority and, and leading, it, there were such unique private victories. We see that he killed bears and lions. And from there, he killed Goliath. And he kept stewarding these opportunities that life gave him, but empowered by God's grace, he, he slayed giants. And, and it was all unto him being a leader of, of the Lord's inheritance. And those were his people. And this description, it's so so unique. And I can say this because I, I've, I've walked with Michael for a while, but there's two descriptions of David. It says that he shepherded them according to the integrity within him and the skill outside of him. So it was his heart and his hand. It wasn't just his hand. It was his heart as well. And I just think this is a, a great framework for who Michael Kulianos is. And I felt this as I was praying for you. I feel like there's a book that you have on the life of David. I feel like the life of David and the descriptions over his life remind me of you, that he was a man after God's own heart. That uh, Acts, I believe it's 13, says that he fulfilled God's purposes for his generation. Jesus would sit on the throne of David like David was a big deal, both then, now, and what will Come, it's just amazing. And I, I feel like you've tapped into what David tapped into in seeking God's heart. And so I wanted to say happy birthday and I wanted to bless you uh, with Psalm 78, 70 through 72, that you are a true shepherd and I'm honored to know you and run with you. I love you so much, brother. I deeply love you. And, uh, and, and one of the things that I, I love about Michael and this lead kind of to the word is um, I believe the Lord is uh, raising up a new breed of leaders and shepherds. Um, and they know, they know uh, when to operate in their gifting and they know when to uh, allow the anointing to stay on the Lord himself. Um, there is a people 
uh, emerging in this hour that are going to be marked by one thing, and it's the presence of God. Uh, it, is, it is the presence of God. It's the distinguishing mark in the days ahead. And it's not the presence of God resting on a man. It's the presence of God resting on a people. It's not a house marked by a gift. It's a house marked by the presence of Jesus. It's houses that aren't marked by the leadership of a man or men, but the leadership of a man whose name is Jesus. And... And that's, what, that's, that's why there's such a depth here. It's why, it's why you, you feel a part of family. It is the Holy Spirit beckoning you, grafting you in, and literally burying your life in the soil that is Jesus Image Church. This is good soil for your marriage, for your kids, for your vocations. Like we need soils for the seeds that God has put within us. And Jesus in its church is very, very, very good soil. It's very good soil. And, and I wanted to, um, there's a book that, that has really marked uh, my journey. Um, I, I do want to echo Michael in saying that I, I think the, the two houses, Upper Room and uh, Jesus Image, are 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 unique expressions, not elite expressions, just unique expressions for what God's doing in this generation. And you know, the, the, the signs and times, uh, the Lord has answers for every question and every problem. Um, and, and I believe he's forming a skin for the harvest that is to come. There is a massive harvest, but he's building houses that will hold those precious souls. Once they're born into the kingdom, he's gonna graft them into families. And they're houses like this that are emerging for the days ahead. And so I want you to know if you're in this room and you're here for the first time, you've been coming a couple of times or you're here every time, there is something unique for this time in the kingdom for you to take your assignment on the wall and to get grafted into a community like this. Because the days ahead, we're gonna need one another. We're gonna need not only the people in this room, but upper room is gonna need Jesus Image Church. We are gonna need each other as houses across state lines within, you know, who knows what's coming down the pipe from a government standpoint, but we are gonna stand shoulder to shoulder for truth, for the authority of God's word. We are gonna stand shoulder to shoulder. And I believe the kingdom of heaven is going to advance in, in profound ways in the days ahead. As darkness increases, the light within us is going to only shine brighter. It's gonna be amazing. Ha! Ha! I am so expectant. And, and, like, and it's not our zeal for the Lord that's gonna accomplish it. It's his zeal for his house. It's his zeal, it's his purposes, it's his solutions, it's his grace, it's him sourcing us to do what only he can do through us. And it's actually what marked the early church. And so I wanna, I wanna read you, I don't oftentimes do this, um, but I wanna read you some excerpts from a book that um, Michael may or may not endorse, but I am going to endorse it in front of you. Uh, because it, it really has put language uh, for me as a leader. It's put language for what I sense the Lord leading in this hour and what the Lord is building uh, in his people. And it's, it's an apostolic move. And Rick Joyner has a book called The Apostolic Ministry. And I just want to read you a couple of zingers from it. Because uh, these singers will help frame kind of where I want to go this morning and just paint a picture for where we're all heading to what I see God doing with Upper Room, what I see him doing with Jesus Image Church and other churches. But stingers, not zingers, which is a golf term if you're not familiar with stingers. Uh, chapter one um, of this book, here's the opening line. You'll love this. It says, there is more power in a single Christian than in all the armies on the face of the earth. Go to Amazon, buy the book. That's the first line in the book. <laughs> there is more power in a single Christian 
than in all the armies on the face of the earth. This truth will become known throughout the earth before the end of this age. God dwells in his people, and when his people come to know this as a living truth rather than a doctrine, the world will then know this truth also. Later in this chapter, this is going to be a little longer excerpt, but this is, it's just so, um, so, so good. (laughs) The emerging generation must have adventure in their lives. The devil often takes advantage of this, but God put it in there for a reason. The final generation on this earth are going to live the greatest adventure the world has ever known. There's no greater adventure than the true Christian life, and the true Christian life is about to be restored to the earth. This true and ultimate adventure is food for the soul. Many try to meet this needs with movies and books, Um, And they live vicariously through those things, but none of these will ever fully satisfy the longing for this reality in our lives. Nothing can satisfy this longing like true Christianity. We must also understand that this will mean the end of the church as it is now. Radical change is coming. And those who are not discerning enough to see it and to become a part of it will not survive much longer. This is not a slam against the church as it is, which has been effective in its time and powerful salt and life in the earth in its generation. But the church is also the mother of the last great day ministry, which is soon emerging. However, just as Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin, the last son born to Israel, the same will happen to the church when the last day ministry is born. We must keep in mind that few biblical types or models fit perfectly with what they are intended to represent. They're parables which are intended to teach us Um, But a major part of the church, as we know it, is not going to die because it has failed, but because it has succeeded. So, so true. It will have given birth to the ministry that will help transition the world between the church age and the kingdom. When Benjamin was born, his mother tried to name him Ben-Onai, which means son of my sorrows. She named him this because she knew that she was dying. However, Israel changed his name to Benjamin, which means son of the right hand, the right hand of God, which is where Jesus sits, which Matthew 26, 64 says, it's the right hand of power. Uh, I believe we're in that transition that um, many expressions of the church that we've seen are actually setting us up for something that we have not seen. And many of those expressions will shift or die out because this new generation is emerging. And I believe the distinguishing mark of this move is going to be the presence of God. It is going to be those three words written on the drawings of that building. Jesus is here. Jesus is here. The Lord is there. It is the description that marks uh, these houses, and it marks this house. Uh, It marks this community. And I believe uh, the transition is happening individually and corporately, meaning there's people in here, um, and you have been in a season of sorrow. You have been in a season where uh, you've been transitioning, and that transitioning has been incredibly challenging. And like Rachel, the temptation is to name this season sorrow, but I believe the Lord is setting you up to hear the Father define this season as a Benjamin season, that you will actually find favor through the sorrow, you will find purpose through the pain, you will find breakthrough through the breakdown, you will find joy through the sorrow, you will find light through the darkness, that the hallway will lead you to a place of occupation. There's a process to the promise, always. And so don't, don't, 
don't let your natural mind name this season something that it's not to be named because a season doesn't have to define you. A season actually will transform you to enter into the promise and purpose that he's had for you. And I believe the earth is in a transition right now and many are attempting to define this transition as sorrow, pain, hardship, division. We see the eminent shadow that seems to be increasing upon our nation, but I see harvest, man. I see hope. I see Jesus positioning us to break our one loaf and feed the masses. Like he is the God who defies odds. He defies them. <laughs> he defies them. He's just looking for willing vessels that will, that will let him define this season uh, for us. And I believe this is a time where Benjamin is going to emerge. Benjamin is actually a picture of the last day church. Um, man, I think there's so many parallels uh, in this Rachel giving birth uh, to ben, ben Honai, and yet the father says, This is not Ben Honai, this is Benjamin. Because listen, Jacob, who became Israel, he didn't want to look at what God birthed through that pain and constantly name it sorrow. He was going to raise what God birthed through that trial. And so he in faith says, no, this is not the son of my sorrow. This is the son of my favor. Matthew, uh, Matthew Henry, who uh, is a, he writes commentaries that I dig into. He said this about um, Israel renaming uh, Ben-Honai, Benjamin. He said, Jacob, because he would not renew the sorrowful remembrance of the mother's death every time he called his son by name. So he changed the name. And I believe the Lord this morning is gonna change the name of this season for some of you. Because listen, what happens is when life throws you a curveball and when circumstances come at you and you begin to define seasons through the natural lens, then that season, like a day becomes weeks, weeks become months, months become years, and it's just your plight, and you lose expectation, you lose hope, because that one season, which was your set up, became the season where you got set back, and you never got into the purposes and promises of God through that trial and pain. And I believe the Lord wants to increase faith through the light and momentary afflictions that some of you are facing. From eternity's standpoint, they are light and momentary. From your perspective, you are like, Lord, this ain't light, it ain't momentary. It's been going on for a while, it's heavy, I don't wanna get up, I can barely look in the mirror, my marriage is breaking down, my finances are there, but from the eternal perspective, he says it's light and momentary. And I'm producing something in you that is an eternal weight of glory. You for eternity will weigh this and it will be defined as glorious for all of eternity because of how you have stewarded the affliction of this season. And I believe that's for us individually, but I also believe it's for us corporately. I believe, I believe the Lord is, is uh, <laughs> I believe the Lord is setting us up corporately um, for this harvest, for uh, what he's doing. And, and what I love about Michael, I've walked with Michael now and, and I, I hear his process. I'm in his dome. Like I get in there. I know his dome. I know what he's processing, thinking through. And here's what I love about Michael. This is why I trust Michael. Um, <laughs> is uh, Michael has one plan, one strategy and it's daily bread. There isn't, there isn't a five-year plan here. I don't even know if there's a year plan or a month plan. And that, that should actually, listen, listen, that may seem like, oh, that's, that's not wise. And in the world's eyes, it's not, it's foolish. But the foolishness of the world is actually the wisdom 
of the Father. And I, I believe the Lord is looking for leaders that will tether themselves in every season and say, Lord, I'm not in this position because of my plan, because of my strategy, because I came up with something as a leader. I'm in this position simply because I've been seeking your face and following you. And that pursuit as a leader, that pursuit as a leader is who you want to follow as a follower. Thank you. God is building his house. He wants his house back. He said, my house, not our house, my house. My nine-year-old is beautiful, amazing, cute, and sweet, but she can pop an attitude at times. (laughs) Part of that attitude is her attempting to do things in my house (laughs) that she's living in. I'm such a dad right now. My dad used to pull this on me, but I'm like, I'm like, baby girl, did you pay rent this week? No, this is, this is my house. I am the father of this house, and I have provided for you all that you need to live in my house. And I, I feel the Lord's zeal as the father of his house. To say, this is not our house. This is my house. And I have provided all that you need when you come into my house. And he is looking for leaders that will allow him to build his house. He said this. He said, he said, he said in Psalms 127, unless the Lord builds the house, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. The laborers labor in vain. And how would you know if you're laboring in vain? It's a great question. But I don't know, as his people, if we know the difference between a leader that's leading in vain and the Lord actually building the house. I I, I, I don't. Like, I'm confused sometimes when, when I follow leaders in the church and 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 what they're rolling out oh i'm really in a good mood i love i love his church but i just think there's more for it but there there's there's pastors that have these leadership podcasts and and i'm i'm all about like wisdom as a leader to help impact and influence people but i'm listening to them talk about how to lead god's people and the name jesus is not mentioned at all it is, it is a wisdom that is, uh, it's God-given, but man, you don't have to be tethered to the face and person of Jesus in order to build the thing that they're equipping them to build. And I think the distinguishing mark between the two houses is, is he there? Is he there? Is he there? Because the Lord is committed to building his house. And, and one of the things in, that, I, that I see theologically in the last days that the house of God will be is it will be a bridal chamber. Yes. It will be a bridal chamber. The Holy Spirit is preparing the earth for a wedding. We are closer than we ever have been. The Holy Spirit, my description of the Holy Spirit is he's heaven's wedding planner. <laughs> And he is building a bridal chamber. He is building a bridal chamber for you and for me so that, listen, (laughs) one of the things that, one of the things I see the Lord doing right now, um, my wife recently had a dream. And in the dream, she was, uh, she was, (laughs) she was in like a bridal store and she was trying on dresses and the attendant was bringing her these dresses and they were like, they were like super tight on her. And like had slits showing too much skin. She would put it on and she'd look in the mirror and she's like, this is so revealing. And she tried on several of them and then finally she leaned out and she said, I'm a bride. 
She said, brides aren't intended to be sexy. Brides are intended to be beautiful. And I feel one of the things the Holy Spirit is doing as the wedding planner and bringing the bride into the bridal chamber is he's power washing us of all that we've placated upon ourselves to be sexy and attractive to other things. And there's a beauty that's emerging inside of us that's just attractive to the one thing, our bridegroom, King Jesus. <laughs> there's a beauty that we possess before him. There's a beauty a glory that he's going to bestow upon a people. And that glory is going to be so attractive to him. But here's what I truly believe is that when the lost and unbelieving come into an environment like that, something's going to awaken inside of them because there is this innate God-designed desire for beauty and for love. And when they see a bride that's beautiful in love, Love with a bridegroom, they are just going to submit and go, I want to love someone like that. I want to love someone like that. We, we planted the upper room in the homosexual community of downtown Dallas. They did not want to hear any of my messages. They didn't. I didn't, I mean, I was jumping, I'm, I'm like, I'm all over it, and like, Jesus, he loves you, but they were over the name Jesus, they were over the conversation of Jesus, but when they came into an environment where there was a bride in love with the bridegroom, their walls came down, because they had only heard about him, they hadn't actually seen people truly love him. It's first love, it's loving him. It's not loving people in the name of loving him. It's loving him. It's adoring him. It's first commandment, adoration to the one. The scripture I wanted to come at you from is Psalms 132 today. If you have your Bible, Psalms 132. If you're not familiar with this psalm, uh, I, believe it's, I believe it's the most um, important psalm in the Psalter. Um, I believe it's why the Psalter exists. That's a big statement, so I'm going to say it again. I believe Psalms 132 is the uh, most significant psalm in the Psalter because it's the foundation for how we got the Psalms, the majority of the Psalms were written either by David or the Levitical priests that were under him. Um, you have some other guys that were sprinkled into that, but David probably led the singular most extravagant worship expression the earth has ever seen under David's tabernacle. Uh, a majority of the Psalms were written um, in the tabernacle of David. Like better is one day in your courts than a thousand days elsewhere. Asaph wrote that sitting in the tabernacle of David where 33 years unceasing worship adoration was established in Israel under the leadership of King David. And Psalms 132, they think, was written by Solomon who was David's successor, his son, and I think he was shaking in his boots because he knew he had big shoes to fill. In Psalms 132, they think, is Solomon reflecting upon the life of his father and a specific vow his father made with God. We don't know when this vow was made, but we do know that David made vow with God. And I believe it was the secret sauce to all that David would accomplish in his life. Like there's great descriptions of the life of David. If it would be said of you or of me that at the end of our days, we fulfilled every purpose God had for us, like check the box, well done, good and faithful servant, amen? I want to hear that. I wanna be faithful as David was faithful. 
Um, David was defined as a man after God's own heart. Again, you can look at books as to why that is. Look at characteristics and traits of what made him that. But I believe deeply that Psalms 132 is the reason David carried the descriptions and accomplished what he accomplished as God's son, as God's servant, and ultimately as Israel's king. And my prayer this morning is that I can set you up to make the same vow that David made. Because God's desire has not changed. And so Solomon in Psalms 132, verse 1, he's reflecting again upon his David's, his, his father's life. He says, remember, O Lord, on David's behalf all of his affliction how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. So here's the vow that David made. He said, surely I will not enter my house nor lie on my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we have heard of it in Ephrath. We found it in the field of Jar. Let us go into his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priest be clothed with righteousness and let your godly ones sing for joy. David made a vow with God. Most likely he made that vow as a teenager in the sheep fields that we read about in Psalm 78. We don't know the exact moment. But we know that David's life lined up to this vow that he desired to live a life that would be unto God finding a resting place on the earth. You can see glimpses of it when Saul, who did not have this pursuit, Saul who feared man, Saul who was insecure, little in his own eyes, became demonized as a leader. He gets rejected as a king, and when he gets rejected, he gets demonized, who do they call upon? The the shepherd in the sheep fields. He had a reputation of playing a harp, and when he played the harp, it was known that the presence of God would rest upon David. How that happened, I don't know. I don't know if David had like pop-up concerts out there, which just (laughs) strumming the guitar, but somehow word was out about his pursuit as a teenager. And so David gets called into the king's chambers, and he's playing the harp, and the demons flee, and I believe it's because of this vow. It put him before Saul. I believe David had a history with this vow, seeing lions and bears be killed by his bare hands. We see the history that he had when he goes and gets the five smooth stones and slays Goliath, but I believe it was all because of this vow that he made. Lord, I want a life that is defined by you resting on me. In all that I am, in all of my strength and energies, may this become my all-consuming desire to set you and your face before me. It's a Psalms 27, 4. One thing I ask, this is what I seek, that I may gaze upon the beauty of the Lord all the days of my life. The beauty of Jesus is the answer to every issue in this room. And David knew that. And it found favor with God. David did not find favor with God because he was valiant, because he was brave, because he was full of faith. David found favor with God because he sought God's desire for his life. And it was, Lord, let my life be a resting place for you. It's why you're in this room this morning. It's what drew you here. It's like the deepest desire is that our lives, our marriages, our families would be marked by this reality. Oh, arise, O Lord, you and the ark of your strength and rest upon all that I am. 
God, I want to steward your presence. I want to steward your face before all that I face. I'm going to steward, Lord, your face. I am not going to let anything distract me from the pursuit of your face, Lord. May all that I face be unto your face. (laughs) When this gets cellular, when this gets inside of you, It's what made David, David. I've preached this a lot. You've probably heard me say it. But when David was crowned king, finally the leader of Israel, he's been through the cat and mouse game of honoring Saul, but Saul's still attempting to kill him. There's a whole process to the promise. But he finally emerges as king. Everyone's unified. And he stands up and he leads the nation of Israel in the vow that he had already made with the Lord. Because he says this, He's like rolling out his agenda. And in 1 Chronicles 13, 3, he says, we are going to seek the ark for we forsook it in the days of Saul. Meaning I made this vow with the Lord and if I'm your leader, my vow is now your vow. (laughs) And what happens? The rest of Psalms 132 is profound. The rest of Psalms 132, listen, verse 10. Because like a lot of people are like, oh, you're just going to sit in a room and, 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 and sing songs to Jesus? Like, let's get stuff done. Well, let's get productive. But here's what happens is once this becomes the thing, there's an exchange that takes place. Many people preach Psalms 132, the first couple of verses, but I love the second half. Because in verse 10, listen to this. For the sake of David, your servant, do not turn away from the face of your anointed. For the Lord has sworn. (laughs) Earlier we saw David swearing to the Lord and vowing to the Lord. But in David's vow, the Lord then looks to David and he makes a vow with David. He makes covenant with David because of David's covenant with the Lord. A truth which he will not turn back from. Of the fruit of your body I will set upon your throne. Your sons keep my commandment, my testimony, which I teach them. Their sons shall sit upon your throne forever. Verse 13. For the Lord has desired, he has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation, which is still true today. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell. I have blessed it. I will abundantly bless her with provision. I will satisfy her needy with bread. Her priest I will clothe with salvation. Her godly ones will sing for joy. Therefore, I will cause the strength of David to spring forth through them. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies will be clothed with shame and upon him will a a crown shine. What's my point? Here's the point. Through the one vow that David made with the Lord, the Lord then vows to give him everything he would desire. He gives him generational blessing, provision, satisfaction, life, joy, worship, strength, light, direction, protection, honor. All of that comes from David just saying, all I desire is your face. All I desire is to be a life that's marked by your resting. What is this? This is the simple pursuit. 11.3, 2 Corinthians, it says, don't be deceived as Eve was by the craftiness of the serpent, but return back to the simplicity and purity of devoting yourself to the person of Jesus. And it's a people. It's a people that hold this pursuit. It's people building this together. It's family living in proximity to the presence of Jesus. Like cultural Christianity isn't going to sustain us in the days ahead. And, and I believe this is what I've seen. I have seen people living in proximity to the presence of Jesus daily transforms community and communities. And that's what this is. This is a daily tending to the presence of Jesus. This is a daily tending to his desires, his longings, his pleasures. Lord, may my life 
be a resting place for all that you desire. I'll give you just one simple testimony this week that happened. I shared this with Michael, but we're in the process of building a building too. I hope we like move in at the same time. That would be so awesome. That would just be like, um, we're supposed to open sometime next year. Uh, we have just under 100,000 square feet. It's just south of downtown Dallas. It's this old like millennialville. I mean, there's hipster millennial kids everywhere and we are a magnet for them. <laughs> and, um, and so in this process, like this scripture, I wasn't gonna share this, but I feel like I'm supposed to. This scripture um, where it says, I have uh, eagerly desired to dwell in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, to be my habitation. You know, Jerusalem is Jesus's home. Jesus is gonna descend and he's going to establish his kingdom on earth from a real city called Jerusalem. And I've just been awakened in his desire for that. Um, I went to Jerusalem a little over two, almost two years ago and first time going, but it just, it just whacked me. Like getting baptized in the Holy Spirit was so transformative. And the, the only thing I can describe my journey to Israel is similar to being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Like I, I just, I, like the Hebrew culture and God's heart for the Hebrew people and specifically the land just came alive inside of my heart. And so I'm sitting on uh, the Mount of Olives with uh, a group of people. Sean Bowles was in our group and I write in my journal, um, there's a place for the upper room in Jerusalem. And I knew what that meant. I, it meant that there's a resting place that he wants us to establish. Not that there's not already ones happening there, but Again, just my pursuit has been pretty singular. And Sean Bowles was with us. And Sean's like worshiping and he, he leans over and he goes, hey buddy, I just heard the Lord say the upper room, there's, there's a place in Jerusalem for the upper room. And I'm like, bro, are you reading my journal? And he's like, no, I'm not. And he said, it's gonna be an equipping center. There's gonna be, uh, and he starts prophesying all this stuff. So um, I, again, was touched. First time I went was January last year. Uh, Eight weeks later, through a dream, I knew I was supposed to take some of our worship leaders over there and get them rooted in the land. I'm over there. I connect with two men. One I knew from Dallas. Another that I met was a pastor in Bethlehem. Um, we start journeying together. That specific day, they were going to look at land. Um, it's at the Jewish, um, Muslim. It's like a real significant intersection just outside the old city walls. Like, it's a two-minute walk. And uh, they were walking this land, and, and so I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll pray for you to get land. And I'm not really thinking of this word at the time, but um, long story short, I get grafted into this team where they're going to they're gonna do this Nisi worship center. And the top floor, they want to be uh, prayer and worship, and they want to call it the upper room, and they want us to actually host the nations there to pray and to worship. And so we get this building last January. Uh, this last January, we get into this building. Oh, this is amazing. So on that same trip, we got, no, we, we, the, the building in Dallas. So this is amazing. So I'm in Jerusalem in the old city. We have been looking for a building for like years. No kidding. We, we, we 10 a.m. service, we have 100 people waiting outside at 8 a.m. It's just, it's, it's so burdensome. Um, we don't have enough room. And so we've been looking for a building, looking for a building, looking for a building. The Lord told us downtown, 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 don't move out of downtown, don't go to the suburbs. Everyone's like, go to the burbs. The Lord's like, don't go to the burbs. Um, <laughs> stay in downtown. So, so I'm in Jerusalem my second time. I know the Lord's doing something in this pursuit. And I'm at, uh, a, 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 like we're having these pita shawarma things at lunch. And I'm across, sitting across the table from this guy. And I'm like, hey, man, what's your name? He goes, my name's Jared. I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Dallas. I was like, I'm from Dallas. And I was like, well, what part of Dallas? He said, the design district. Well, no one's from the design district. That's where the upper room is. It's like all warehouse design stuff. He goes, yeah, my wife and I have a warehouse down there that is our home. And I'm like, man, that's crazy. I pastor a church there. I was like, what do you do? He said, commercial real estate. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm looking for a building. Seven, seven months later, we purchased our property from him. Isn't that the Lord's leadership? So get this, it gets even better. Um, so I was, uh, I, I was, we needed to raise 15 million bucks. It's a lot of money, which thank you guys, y'all gave a gift to the, the, 
the building last year and just so blessed. It was like the first seed, I think, that was sown into that. Um, so we, we are getting into this building. We're going into a 40-day fast. We've got to raise 6 million of the 15 by the end of the 40 days. And the Lord starts really speaking to me about Israel out of Psalms 132, a resting place. And I'm just overcome with his desire to build a resting place for him in his land, like his presence is actually him. You know, the whole Michael Culliano's thing about the presence of Jesus is Jesus, that thing. And I'm overwhelmed with that, that the presence of Jesus being Jesus, Jesus wants to be there and he's looking for people that are willing just to host him in his land. I'm overcome with this. And, and my friend Kyle, he's like, hey, we need, we need 2 million to purchase this land. And I'm like, in Jerusalem, sorry, I'm getting my lands confused. In Jerusalem, 2 million while we're raising the 6 million for the land in Dallas. And so I had a fundraiser the next night. And, um, and I heard the Lord say before I went to the fundraiser, he said, he said, if you help me get into my land, I'll help you get into yours. And so I was like, well, what does that mean? What is, you know, like practically it sounds good, but I'm raising funds for Dallas. And so the next day I stood up at a fundraiser for, for Dallas, um, all Dallas people, 20 people or so, they knew they were coming for a fundraiser for our building in Dallas. And I got up and all I talked about was land in Israel. It was a really confusing fundraising page. <laughs> And so at the end, we showed a video and said, so you can give money to Dallas, but I also want you to know we're raising funds for Israel. And uh, we raised, uh, I asked my exec, I said, how much do you think would you, you know, be surprised that we raised? He goes, man, if we raised 400,000, 500,000, be amazing. Well, we raised a million bucks for Dallas that night. And then we raised 100,000 for Israel. Long story short, we ended up raising the, the funds for Israel, but the most unique thing happened two days after that fundraising event. Um, I, got a, I got an email from a guy that I'm mutual, mutual friends, and, and, and he had heard a sermon that I had preached pitching the vision for the building. And he said, I just know that I'm supposed to help you. Can we go have lunch? So I go to lunch with this man. I'm sitting across from him. His name's Brian. And Brian is an architect in our town. He works for a firm, and I didn't know this firm at the time, but the firm was HKS. HKS is the largest architectural firm, one of the largest architectural firms in the world. He started their sports and entertainment branch 30 years ago. It is one of the most, uh, I mean, they're, they're a famous design firm for stadiums. So their first stadium was the Milwaukee Brewer Stadium. They did the Minnesota Vikings Stadium. They did the Indianapolis Colts Stadium. They did the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. They just did the Texas Ranger New Baseball Stadium. And the most, like, biggest one that they did was the L.A. SoFi Stadium. Have you seen that thing? L.A. SoFi is a crazy stadium. And, uh, and he sits in front of me and he goes, listen, I know that I'm supposed to help you build your church. People have said that I've built cathedrals for sports teams, but the Lord told me I'm to build a cathedral for him. And he said, I want to offer, I want to offer my services for free. And the Lord was like, if you help me get into my land, I'll help you get into yours. How? I'm going to give you a modern day Bezalil, the top designer in this field, our building will be known as a Brian Truby, their firm designed building. People will come and look at it. And it's crazy the stuff they're thinking about doing. It'll be iconic in South Town, south of Dallas. What is my point in all of this? My point in all of this is I made a vow with the Lord. I want to build resting places for the Lord. And through this one pursuit of getting land in Israel, through this one pursuit, this architect is going to build a cathedral that's going to be a resting place for the Lord. I don't know what you're after, but if we can just bring divine alignment where the one thing is truly the one thing, I believe the Lord will, and all these things will be given to you. That your, all your desires are found in this one, and it's fighting to keep that desire before any and all desires. I thought that was the Lord, man. I was like, 
You got me, girl. Woo! I thought it was an airplane at first, and then I was like, no, that could be an angel. <laughs> the Lord's really stamping this message. Um, <laughs> hey, I, I just, <laughs> family, can I call us family? Can, can we go after this together? Can you know that there's a tribe in Dallas that's contending for your promises and will you contend for ours? I feel like we're on the same trajectory that God, God, there's a, an emerging victorious, beautiful bride that is saturated by the presence of Jesus, but they are in love with the one. And there's a generation longing for that. They really are. They're longing for longer services. They're longing for simpler agendas. They're longing for tables to sit at with you if you're older in this room. You're being positioned to be a mother and father. The presence of God is establishing family. And it's around tables where the presence of Jesus is marking it. But man, millennials are looking for mothers and fathers. They're looking for those that they can rest under, that will be, they'll be raised up in, believed in. And I'm looking around the room at some gray-haired, seasoned believers, and you're here for that reason. You're here to pour into students that are traveling across the nation. Like with this burning desire, they're sacrificing everything. We have people in our, our world that are laying down med school, laying down law school to pursue this one thing. And they're looking for mothers and fathers that have lived lives of this. There's room for you here. The table's big. And we need one another in order to go after this. And so just get drafted into what God's doing here in this home because it is unique. It is rare air, this place, the agenda. It's rare air, it's uncommon for now, but I believe houses are emerging that are gonna model for the church how to house God. <laughs> so I just want you to put your hand on your heart and I'm just gonna ask the Holy Spirit. Uh, only He can initiate this with you. So I, I don't want this to be something that you initiate. I want him to initiate this with you. But I'm gonna ask the Holy Spirit to initiate a yes in your heart for this vow. The one thing vow. The Lord, I, I my gifts, opportunities, my vocation, my marriage, my relationships, my future. Lord, I wanna make vow with you like David did that my Pursuit will be a resting place for you. I feel like there's a restaurant owner, like a coffee shop owner in the room. And I just see this one pursuit for your coffee shop. I see a lawyer in the room, one pursuit for your law firm. I see professionals that have this one pursuit. You're like, I haven't seen it done before. Well, neither have Michael and I in many respects. It's just what he's doing. He's tattooing a people that have this pursuit. Lord, may my life be a resting place for you. May you find a yes in my life. May you find a yes in my influence, in my giftings. Come what may, your face is my pursuit. Your face is my desire. So if you're sensing that tug and you feel like, I mean, I feel like I'm making vow with the Lord this morning. Like I wanna cross that threshold. I wanna, I wanna surrender my life for that goal. I just, I just, when you feel prompted, would you just stand to your feet as a way of just saying, Lord, I'm standing before you today and I'm signing my life up. I see a blank check and I just see you signing the check with your life. I just see the Lord saying, saying, will you give me everything? No matter the cost, no matter the affliction, no matter what's before me, Lord, <laughs> I wanna say yes, that my life will be a resting place for you.
where it's been complicated, Lord, I pray right now deliverance. I just see some, some are getting delivered right now, just out of the, the complexities. I feel like there's a, a mind binding serpent on some of your heads. It's just tightened and tightened and tightened because of the reasonings and the calculating and trying to figure out the equation. And the Lord says, this is it. One plus one, me and you, resting place. This one thing is the answer to everything. And so I break off right now, heaviness, weariness. Father, that your presence is the answer right now. For familiar cycles, Lord, specifically in marriages where there's been ruts, just like we just get in ruts, we just get in ruts. I see both of you making this vow and saying, our covenant is unto this covenant. It's him resting upon us. I see husbands, you leading out in this venture, you leading out at night, you leading out at the dinner table, you leading out in the car. This one thing, it is practical. I wanted to add what Michael is saying about marriages. I really feel that in this room today that, you know, when David brought the ark in, um, he was dancing wildly before it and his wife was standing up and looking out the window, despising him for how ridiculous he looked. And, and when Michael when he was getting ready for that fundraiser that he was telling you about, and he told me, I think I'm gonna raise money for Israel instead of our building. I looked at him and thought, you're nuts. These people aren't gonna understand what you're talking about. And you know what? I don't even know if they did understand, but God saw. And so I just wanted to encourage you couples to even in this, in the presence of the Lord to grab each other's hand and say, I'm not going to call you crazy when you put him first. I'm not going to call you crazy when you make a weird decision, when you give money here or there. I'm going, I'm with you. I'm with you in this vow. I'm with you in this vow. I will not despise you from a window. I should be dancing out there with you like a crazy lady celebrating the Lord. So I just want to invite you as couples to just say yes. We say yes. I will not hold my husband my wife back from following the Lord wholeheartedly. We will do this in honor and submission together. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to pray for the Levites, if you're a worship leader or a musician, would you just lift your hands? I just declare uh, Holy Spirit to come out of the come out, come out, come out. <laughs> just see the Lord pouring an oil upon you. And I, I, I see this, this becoming a reality in, in the secret place in the hidden place. I see you closing your door. And I, 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 see, I see songs, I see songs and sounds from the secret place, like seeds he's gonna plant in your heart. But I, I believe, I believe that Jesus' image, there's going to be songs that articulate this reality. And they're going to come forth from hearts that are signing up for this vow. And so I just want to acknowledge that a seed has been planted today. And as you water and cultivate that seed, it is going to bear fruit that's going to feed the nations. This is a collective house effort. Gifts thrive in this pursuit because it's not unto the gift, it's unto <laughs> the tree of life that is Jesus. So I just anoint there's been such a grace on our house for those songs, for those sounds. And I just declare it over these hands and hearts, these minds. Just these simple love songs 
simple love songs, like almost lullabies for the church. Lullabies that are gonna put her at rest, put her at ease. Lullabies are gonna come through this house. Just simple childlike songs that will be sung for generations. Just declare that Jesus over this house. Songs and sounds and sermons that are under this one end. Thank you, Father. feel the Lord wants to set many of you free this morning from the complexity that Michael talked about, from a, a life that has multiple visions. Mike Bickle said two weeks ago when he ministered on Sunday night, he said, IHOP was never my dream. IHOP's my assignment. Jesus is my dream. And I know that many of you, I can feel it in the room, are struggling with secret sin, bondage, confusion. I just want you, without even me feeling like I need to do a traditional altar call or preach a message, I, I want you to just forget about everyone in the room right now and seize the moment. This is a word, yes, for our house, but for you individually. I want you to get out of your seat right now and come up here and get free in your Father's house. Get free and ask the Lord to give you eyes for Jesus alone. Come on, just come. Let's move the pulpit. Give Miller his Bible. Come. There's no shame, no, no condemnation. Come in the Lord's house, who is a Redeemer and a Savior and a Deliverer, who's making a beautiful bride. Come and give all to Jesus. For some of you, this is your first time. For others, you're renewing your covenant before the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. This is really beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Father. So this is very simple. It's so simple that uh, the enemy tries to blind us to it. But multiple visions and pursuits in life just bring stress and fear. So in a marriage, there comes a point during the vows where the bride and groom forget about the cathedral and the person officiating their bridal party and they just look each other in the eyes and so right now for all of you who've come forward just close your eyes give Jesus your full attention and we're going to pray and he's going to hear every word and there will be a divine transaction a holy moment that will set you free so that you too can be the worshiper and the lover of God that you're called to be. Just pray this out loud. Heavenly Father, forgive me. I repent of looking elsewhere. Have mercy on me. 
cleanse my heart. You said, if I confess my sin, you are faithful and just to forgive my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. So I confess my sin this morning. I lay my sin at your feet, the foot of the cross. Wash me in the blood of Jesus. Cleanse my soul. Jesus, I give all to you this morning. This is my vow, my wedding vow. Give me eyes for you and you alone. Give me dove's eyes, eyes of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I declare before you and your people that you are the Holy Son of God, that you died on the cross and shed your blood to cleanse me this morning. And I believe, Lord Jesus, that you were buried and raised again. You are alive forever, the victorious Son of God. And I believe that you're seated at the right hand of the Father, and that you're coming back again. This morning, I make myself ready the best I know how and I declare that you are the Lord and the Savior and my bridegroom and my King I am yours forever and I turn from the world and look to you alone in the name of Jesus Amen. Amen. Hold on, just just don't 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 change the frequency. Don't change the dial. If you came forward, I just want you to lift your hands to heaven. And if you're in your seats, just by faith, I want you to stretch your hands out toward these precious, precious children of the Lord. Now Jesus made a promise. And here was the promise that we would receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on us. It is the Holy Spirit who does the work. And there are many of you who need family members to receive what you've received this morning, friends. And so as children right now, I just want you to receive. You don't need to beg. It's the Lord who's accomplished this on your behalf. And when I pray, I want you to give your full attention to the presence of the Holy Spirit. He may come differently to all of you. I just want you to give him your attention. That's all. Church, are you ready? I just want you to stretch your hands and just gently pray in the Spirit out there in the crowd. Father in heaven, I thank you that you have promised the wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit and that Jesus, you are the baptizer. Jesus, you said, if we asked, we would receive. And so right now, I ask you, your children ask you, for true bread, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Be filled, all of you. Be clothed in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. May the fire of God come upon you. May the oil from heaven be poured out right now and the gentle dove descend upon your anxiety. May the wind of glory come and purge and strengthen and invigorate you. Holy Spirit, come. Come and touch your inheritance right here. Fill them to the uttermost with new wine, with joy unspeakable. You know our every need, and we love you. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We 
love you, Lord. Thanks, Lord Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you that you're calling them, speaking to them. You're actually handing out assignments. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you, Michael, so much, Lo. Thank you. I just want to pray something as a pastor here. And I want us all to agree. Come on, just lift your hands to heaven. Lord, we receive the word of the Lord this morning. And continue to reduce us to one thought, one goal. We receive your word. Make this a resting place. Make our hearts resting places. Rest in our homes. Rest in our city. And we pray for other churches in this city who are crying out as well. Touch them. We pray for Upper Room. Even now, as they're meeting, do it there too. Do it there, Lord, amongst the leaders, their pastors, the youth, all of them. Lord, let that whirlwind spin. Let it turn. We love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. Um, wow, it's amazing. Uh, can we let Michael and Lowe know how grateful we are? To be there? Before you go, um, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful. If you're under the presence of God, you, you just stay right there. Before you go, tonight is going to be uh, something else. So I don't know how else to really describe what I feel like the Lord's going to do. I feel like Jesse and I got a down payment last night at the house. And uh, so come, come early, come hungry, and get ready, okay? I love you so much. See you tonight. demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus shed his blood. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again from the dead on the third day to give you life and to prove that he is the Son of God who he said he was. Today he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And for those who belong to him,